Good evening, folks. Good to see everyone back tonight. Let's grab a songbook number 413. Number 413 in the Soul Stirring Songbook. Stand up, stand up for Jesus. Good to be in church on a Sunday night now. Number 413, let's sing it together. All three verses now, number 413, verse number one. Stand up, stand up for Jesus, ye soldiers of the cross. Lift high his royal banner, it must not suffer loss. From victory unto victory, the army shall he lead, till every foe is vanquished and Christ is Lord indeed. Stand up, stand up for Jesus, the trumpet call that extra note, John. That was good. Welcome back. Glad to have you back tonight. Oh, no, that was me that was missing, wasn't it? All right. Uh, we had a great time up at uh, Joy Baptist Church in Orville this morning. We got to see, uh, not only see our grandson Ben get baptized, but I had the privilege of baptizing him. And so uh, we enjoyed that. That was a blessing. So uh, always thinking when we're sitting there, I, I know that I shouldn't be like this, but I'm in the middle of church there and I'm thinking of what time it is and what's going on here at that very moment in our schedule there. So uh, the, the heart is where the home is where the heart is. I think that's how that goes. Uh, but we're glad to be back here this week. Got in time, got back in time to take a nap. Always important on Sunday. All right. Sunday afternoon is nap time. S-A-I-N-T. Saint. All right, so that's, that's how you make, become a saint, by sleeping on Sunday afternoon. So we got that accomplished today, got ready for church here tonight. Good to be back. Brother Kevin, if you would, lead us in prayer tonight, please. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. All right, let's turn together to what a friend we have in Jesus. Number 355. Number 355 in the songbook. Number 355. Let's sing verse 1. What a friend we have in Jesus, all our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Oh, Yeah. 
If we can have some ushers come and help us. We're getting back in the pattern of doing this after COVID time. Some fellas come and help us with the offering. I think two will do it. Well, there's three. No, come on up. Come on up, Travis. <laughs> Don't try to duck out now. You committed. You stood up. All right, pray for Brother Bill Maloney. Bill and Ed and Sue will be leaving tomorrow morning, heading back from Colorado back this way. So pray that they'll have a safe trip as they come back. Uh, I think that's all uh, that I can think of offhand that we need to pray for, so remember them in prayer. So let's go to the Lord together for the offering. Pastor Braden, lead us in prayer, please. All right, we have a VBS meeting tonight following the service. Immediately after the service tonight, those that are going to volunteer and help with Vacation Bible School, please join us for just a few minutes after the church service. Again, teen camp is coming up July 25th to 30th. Uh, we have some campers going down. If you'd like to help support or sponsor a camper to go down there, it costs them $110 for the week of camp. So if you'd like to do that, uh, just write your name, uh, put it in an offering envelope and put it in, mark for camp, or write it on the memo line of a check, either way you want to do it, uh, and we'll be glad to uh, make sure everybody gets to camp that wants to go to camp this, this year. All right, did you sing for birthdays this morning? All right, was Doug, where's, was Doug here for this morning? All right, Jane Carr. It's a good thing they were here this morning to get sung to because they're going to miss it tonight. The only one you didn't sing for this morning drum roll please, was Sonia, all right, because uh, we were not here this morning. It's interesting, we were, at, we were at the church up in Orville at Joy Baptist, and Pastor Wilcox got up, and I think they had two birthdays, neither one of them was there, that, that just doesn't happen here apparently, neither one of them was there, and so he said, is anybody having a birthday this week, and I, I quickly volunteered, I mean, what else am I supposed to do, and pointed at my wife, just automatically. And so they sang happy birthday down there. But here's the difference, kids. They don't do the right thing. They just sing happy birthday. There's no woos or wees or wows or anything like that. And she was so depressed when she walked out of church this morning because she didn't get those. So tonight, make sure you put those in. Let's sing happy birthday to Sonia this evening. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, God bless you. Happy birthday to you. Are you okay? Very okay. Pastor Braden, come ahead. Okay, let's, uh, let's take our songbook and we'll turn to number 296 before the message tonight. Number 296, looking forward to getting into it now. Opening the Word of God, number 296, let's stand 
as we sing to prepare now, follow on, the song says, number 296, let's sing verse 1. Down in the valley with my Savior I would go, where the flowers are blooming and the sweet waters flow. Everywhere He leads me I would follow, follow on, walking in His footsteps till the crown be won. singing tonight, you may be seated. Amen. It's Sunday evening. Let's sing our regular, traditional, habitual choruses, all right? Thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. Thank you, Lord, for making me whole. So rich and free. Oh, it is wonderful to be a Christian. Oh, it is wonderful to be God's child. Oh, it is wonderful to have your sins forgiven. Oh, it is wonderful to be redeemed, justified, forever reconciled. Genesis chapter 1 tonight in your Bible, please. The book of Genesis chapter 1. I hope you can find that okay. I'll give you a few minutes. Genesis chapter 1. We're going to begin with a couple of very familiar verses, and the title of my message was in the bulletin, if you noticed it. And you need to make sure you read it carefully. Because the title of the message tonight is not God making us in His own image, but us making God in our own image. And you might say, well, that's, a, that's an anomaly, that's an opposite, that's not correct. But I hope by the end of the message you'll understand why it's been titled that way, because we live in a day and in a time where instead of accepting how God made us, we want to make God in our own image. And we're going to look at that in Scripture this, this evening. Genesis chapter 1 and verse number 26, two very familiar verses this evening. Genesis chapter 1 and verse number 26. And God said, let us make man in our image, after our likeness. 
And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. Let's go to the Lord together in prayer. Now, Father, tonight we come with hungry hearts. Father, we come with needful hearts. Lord, we need the word of God. Father, in this crazy world that we live in, this mixed up society where folks don't know up from down, evil from good, Father, we're thankful we have a foundation. We have a rock to put our feet upon, and that is the Word of God. We're thankful that, every, uh, that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for us. And I pray, Father, tonight that as we look at the, the, the pages of Scripture and look at what you've recorded for us, that, Father, we would, we would esteem it as it is, not the words of man, but the words of God, that, Father, we would willingly and lovingly submit ourselves to what the Word of God says. Father, challenge our hearts tonight. Bring us into remembrance of some things. And, Father, encourage us as we move forward in our Christian life by that which we hear tonight. Most of all, we pray, should there be one tonight that's never received Christ into their heart and life, that, Father, tonight you'd speak to that heart especially and show them that all that you've done by Calvary, by your Son, all that's been done has been done because of your love and care for them, that they might become a child of God. Bless your word to this, this evening, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Genesis chapter 1, verse number 26 and verse 27. We're going to focus mainly on, mainly on verse number 27. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. It's amazing in the Bible how God can knock two pins down with one verse. Solve two problems in very few words. Give us more information than society's been able to give us in thousands and thousands of years. The two things he addresses in verse number one are simply this. Where you came from and who you are. Now, isn't that remarkable? I mean, that's a real tough one, isn't it? Where you came from is the first half of verse 27, and who you are is the second half of verse 27. You say, well, preacher, that's not, that's not difficult. That's not hard. Take a survey. Walk around your neighborhood. Ask them where they came from, how they got here. Ask them, especially in our very confused day and time right now, what they are and see if you can figure it out or if they can even figure it out. And yet God in one small verse, in very few words, in verse number 27 says, so God created man in his own image. Evolution is not a new thing. It's been around since I was in elementary school, which is not that long ago. But it's been around for a little while, and they, they have changed it. I remember when I was growing up, I always saw the charts of the, uh, of the monkey that started walking, or the, the, the thing that started walking upright became a monkey, became a pro, a pro uh, I can't remember, Cro-Magnon man, and then the Piltdown man, and, and then eventually became man. And boy, I was so happy we finally became that. And it didn't take too long till they realized that that was all a hoax and they had to take those out of the textbooks. And actually, kids today have no idea when I talk about this, they have no idea what I'm talking about because they've not been taught that because science had to change that because they realized it was, it was fallible, it was not true. But the theory is still taught. In fact, just this week, if you've been following, just this week they came out with a new telescope, the James Webb Telescope. It is as big as a city block, and as they look into the future, and, and, and this is beyond my human comprehension, so I'm just going to tell you what I read and what they said about it. It, it can look not only into, into outer space, but it, it is so powerful, it cost them $10 billion to, to build this thing. It is so powerful that it can go, it can go 13 billion years into the past. A telescope. Because of the light movement and all this stuff, and again, I, that's beyond my, my comprehension. But by their claims, they're showing pictures, there have been pictures in the paper, uh, pictures on the news flashes, all that, of what they're seeing. They're seeing the beginning of the cosmos 13 billion years ago, where the galaxy is just beginning to form, and the stars are just coming into existence, and the moons and the planets are just, just now getting ready. 13 billion years ago, which... For added information there, they tell us was only one billion years after the Big Bang. 
So I thought, well, we got, we got a lot out of our $10 billion right there. We not only found out that the universe is 14 billion years old because it was $1 billion before what they can see now. Now they're going to have to spend another $10 billion so they can get back and see one more million before the 13, or one more, yeah, whatever those numbers are. They've got to look at all that stuff and all that stuff out there. You know what the Bible says? So God created man in his own image. I could have saved them $10 billion. Because the Bible states it so clearly and so simply. You say, well, that takes faith to believe. Yes, it does. You have to believe what God says. But wouldn't you have to admit, I wouldn't, wouldn't anybody have to admit that it takes a lot more faith to believe that 14 billion years ago everything appeared out of nothing and became what it is and we have what we have. We have, we have human beings now with all the functions of our human body, with our three-pound brain and all of, our, all of our organs intact and all that. And that just that didn't evolve over a period of time. The Bible says, so God created man in his own image. Look in chapter 2, and I know I'm preaching to the choir here. Chapter 2 and verse 7, but it is good for us to be reminded of those things that are true. Because when you go out into that world and you see all this news media hubbub about, about the, this new telescope, what it says, it, sometimes it'll cause especially younger Christians to wonder and to question. And many, even older Christians, have adapted their belief on the origin of the universe to accommodate scientific theory. And that's not good. We need to be reminded of what the Bible says. It says that God created man in his own image. And then chapter 2 and verse 7 tells us how he did it. I mean, isn't that, isn't that great information? Here's what he did, and here's how he did it. How did he do it? Well, billions and billions of years ago. No. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. It was so simple. It happened in a moment. It happened on a specific day. That God, and, and for our finite minds, let's just put it this way, God, like a young boy on the beach or young boy in the sand, just went over there and made a sandcastle. Only his sandcastle was very intricate because it had a nose and it had eyes and it had hair and it had fingers and it had fingernails and it had all this, it had all, well, maybe not fingernails, that's a result of dying. So, Anyways, don't know if it had a belly button or not, that's the big debate too, I understand that. But God made, that, God made that out of the dust of the earth, out of sand, and it was, it was lifeless, and it was dormant, and it was absolutely nothing until God breathed into it the breath of life. And when he gave it mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation, that man became a living soul. God tells us where we came from. We are a direct creation of God. Just like the Bible tells us God has eyes, the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth, beholding the evil and the good. Just God, as God has hands, the hands of the Lord, the arm, his arm is not short that he cannot save, neither is ear heavy that he cannot hear. The Bible talks about his hair over in the book of Revelation. We are made in the image of God. Now again, there's some complexities to that also because God is a spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. But we are created and made in the image of God. Signed, sealed, delivered, written off, end of story. Don't need anything in addition to that. God told us where we came from. He also told us what we are. And I'll not spend a lot of time with that, but the end of verse number 27 simply says, male and female created he them. Now you folks that are over 20, that pretty well covers almost everybody here. Used to say if you're over 50 or over 60, you've got to remember back. If you're over 20, you remember when all there was was male and female? I mean, I'm not talking about that long ago. 20 years, 10 years maybe even. Nobody questioned that. But now, people don't know what they are. You know, if you don't know what you are, You'll never know where you came from or where you're going. If you can't figure out, if you can't figure out what you are, I'm sorry, you might, as well just, you might as well hang it up right there. You're not going to pass any SAT test to get into college. You're not going, you're not going to get hired if you can't even figure that out. And, and can I say this? If you know what you are, look like what you are. In the, he made them male and female. If you're male, look like a male. 
If you're female, look like that. I think that sounds so simple. And in church, that makes all the sense in the world, doesn't it? But go outside these doors and look at the young men that are trying to look as effeminate as they can. And you get, look at the young women, I don't say ladies, women, that are trying to look as masculine as they can. We live in a confused society. And the answer to all that was not 13 billion years ago. The answer to that was 6,000 years ago when God created man in the Garden of Eden and placed him there and made Adam and made Eve and made him in his image. So the Bible gives us the information we need. Now that's not my message tonight. That was all free. So you be relieved. You don't have to pay for any of that. But what I want to talk about is God making us in his own image. You know, man, modern man, does not like that. Just like they don't like God made man in his own image, just like they don't like male and female created in them. They don't like the fact that God made us and we are subservient or responsible to God. I really believe there are a lot less atheists and agnostics than claim to be. Most of them are claiming to not believe in God simply because they don't want to have to think they have ever have to give an account to God. They believe in God. Uh, somebody has said, as long as there are tests in school, there will be prayer in school. As long as there are wars and men in foxholes, there will be prayers going up to God. And it's not that people don't believe in God, they just don't want to admit that they're going to have to give an account one of these days, but down in their heart and their soul, they know there's a God. And so what man tries to do is bring God down to our level, and instead of God making us in his, his image, we want to make God according to our thinking, according to our ma mind, according to our manner. Look here in Genesis, turn over to chapter 5 and verse number 1. A few more verses about this before we get into it. Genesis chapter 5, verse 1, again, confirming to us where we came from. This is the book of the generations of Adam. In the day that God created man, in the likeness of God made he him, male and female created he them. That just reiterates what we read back in Genesis chapter 1. Confirms to us that we are made in the image of God. Genesis chapter 9. Genesis chapter 9. Verse number 6, very familiar verse. Noah and his sons getting off of the ark. And in, in Genesis 9 and verse 6, God said, Whoso sheddeth man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed. That's a whole other story and a, a sermon. But notice the end, for in the image of God made he man. Now I've said recently that Adam was made in the image of God, but we are made in the image of Adam. Now, technically speaking, that is the truth, because Adam was made sinless and perfect. You weren't. You are born in iniquity and conceived in sin, according to Psalm chapter 51. So we are not ideally in the image of God. We're in the idea, we are in the image of Adam, who was made in the image of God. So when we look at our physical structure, we can still say, I have been created in the image of God. And by the way, that image begins at conception inside the womb of the mother. End of story on that one. There's so many things you can, you can put a period on when it comes to the Bible. But the Bible says we are made in the image of God. Turn over to the New Testament, 1 Corinthians 11. We're going to do a lot of turning here at the beginning. Then we'll slow down later on, about an hour and a half or two. I didn't get to preach for two hours this morning, so I've got to make up for that tonight. 1 Corinthians 11. Some of you are laughing and some of you are worried. 1 Corinthians 11, 7. Just as we're not going to get bogged down in, in Genesis 9, 6 with the shedding of man's blood, just look in verse 7. For a man indeed ought not to cover his head, for as much as he is the image and the glory of God. All right, talking about man. He is the image and the glory of God. When God breathed into Adam's nostrils the breath of life, man became a living soul. That was God's image. One more verse in, in uh, James chapter 3. Going to the right a little bit farther toward the back of the Bible. James chapter 3. Just cementing into our mind this truth and this fact of the creation, that we are created in the image of God. Setting the table now for how we've tried to reverse that table. James chapter 3, verse number 9. 
James 3, 9, Therewith bless we God, even the Father. And therewith curse we men, which are made after the similitude of God. Similitude, likeness, image. We are made in the image of God. So now here we are. Made in the image of God. Uh, go back to Isaiah chapter 64. Again, I said we're going to turn a lot here as, as we start. Isaiah 64. In Jeremiah chapter 18, and we'll, I'll talk about this as you turn to Isaiah 64. Jeremiah 18, Jeremiah says, I went down to the potter's house. Behold, the potter was making something on the wheel. And he was molding it and making it of clay. Now in Jeremiah chapter 18, that which he's making is the nation of Israel. And he's telling the nation of Israel, I'm making you out of this clay, and if the clay is marred, I can simply squash it and start all over again and do with, do with it what I want to. When he's talking about the nation of Israel, he can do anytime, anything he wants to do with them. In Isaiah 64, we find that same example given, but not about the nation of Israel, but about us. Isaiah 64 and verse number 8. Isaiah 64, verse number 8. Isaiah said this, But now, O Lord, thou art our father. We are the clay, and thou art potter, and we, and we all are the work of thy hand. Now you might think I'm going a lot, spending a lot of time on emphasizing this, but this is the basic foundation of the basic truth. We've got to have that basic truth before we can go anywhere else. We are created in the image of God. He's the potter, we're the clay, not the other way around. And as we're going to see tonight, mankind is trying to reverse that system and make us the potter and God the clay. And we can decide what God's like. And we can decide who God is. And we can decide what pleases God and what doesn't please God. We are the potter, he's the clay. So the Bible lays the foundation of this very important truth that God is God and you're not. That's how simple it is. God is God, and I'm not. I am to submit to him, not him to me. I am to worship him, not him worship me. I am to obey him, not him obey me. I'm to accept everything he says, not him accept everything I say. But we've got a problem. Mankind doesn't like that. Go now, if you would, to the book of Psalms, a couple passages here. Psalm 115. Man has a desire, an innate desire, and it shows in three different ways, and that's what we're going to look at. Man has an innate desire to make God in man's own image. The whole reason behind not accepting the, the creation story, the whole reason for not accepting gender identification, the whole thing about not accepting conception uh, as the beginning of life, it's all trying to tell God what we think is right, not what he thinks is right. That we are smart and we are educated and we are reasonable and we are intelligent. And so we can figure these things out. We don't need God to tell us because after all, we are smarter basically than God. And you say, well, nobody would say that. Well, some of them do. <laughs> Most of them won't say it, but they'll think it. They'll practice it. They'll examine it. Look here in, in Psalm 115. Psalm, let me find it. I told you there, and I've I got to find it myself. Psalm 115. Right there near the middle of the Bible, Psalm 115, verse number 1. Not unto us, O Lord... Not unto us, but unto thy name. <laughs> Give glory for thy mercy and for thy truth's sake. See, that's the proper direction, isn't it? All right? Not unto us, O Lord, not to us, but to thy name. Verse 2. Wherefore should the heathen say, Where is now their God? But our God is in the heavens. He hath done whatsoever he hath pleased. Notice verse 4. Their idols are silver and gold the work of men's hands. They have mouths, but they speak not. 
Eyes have they, but they see not. These same qualities that our God has, they make idols with those same things. They have ears, but they hear not. Noses have they, but they smell not. They have hands, but they handle not. Feet have they, but they walk not. Neither speak they through their throat. They that make them are like unto them. So is everyone that trusteth in them. You know what this Hebrew writer is saying? Our God is in the heavens. And we acknowledge he's greater and higher than we are. But the God of the heathen is the creation of their own hands. That which they make in and of themselves. They carve graven images, uh, molten images. The Bible says that they made these things and they, they make them and they worship them. Now, you might say, well, that's an old heathen practice. And basically it is. It's an old-fashioned Archaic, if you want to say that, an old fashioned thing. Most folks have moved past that point. There are some nations and countries in the world today that are still completely given to idolatry. There's even a major religion in the United States that is still given to idolatry. But overall, most folks know that those little statues on the dashboard, those little things in the house, have eyes, but they don't see. They've got mouths, but they don't speak. They've got ears, but they don't hear. You know what, 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 the, what the psalmist just said. That's a man trying to make with his own hands a God that's subservient to him. I made my God. That's what idolatry is all about. That's why God despised it so much in the Old Testament. The number one sin in the Old Testament that God hated was the sin of idolatry. He talked to Israel about it over and over and over again. Thou shalt have no other gods but me. Thou shalt not make unto thee... Commandment number two, thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image. God despises those that try to put themselves above God and say, look what we have made. Let's bow down to it. Here in Psalm uh, 135, turn over to Psalm 135. This is just a sister passage to Psalm 115. And the psalmist again tells us the same thing in fewer verses. But Psalm 135 and verse 15. The idols of the heathen are silver and gold, the work of men's hands. They have mouths, but they speak not. Eyes have they, but they see not. Ear, they have ears, but they hear not. Neither is there any breath in their mouth. They that might make them are like unto them. So is everyone that trusteth in them. What are they trying to do? Make God in man's own image. You remember what one of the, I don't, I want to call it a funny verse. But Exodus chapter 32 at the foot of Mount Sinai when Moses is up getting the Ten Commandments and Aaron, the children of Israel, down at the bottom of the hill. And Moses delays, they say Moses delayed to come down from the mountain. And so Aaron has all the men and women donate their gold, their jewelry. And he puts it into the fire. And when Moses comes down, they're holding up these golden calves. And they're saying, these be thy gods, O Israel, which led thee out of the land of Egypt. These be thy gods. And here comes Moses down the hill with two tablets in his hands. And commandment number two says, thou shalt not. You wonder why Moses broke those tablets right there? Because Israel was breaking them right in front of him. And he knew that the judgment of God was going to come on them. Now God rewrote those tablets. You know how all that went, transpired. And they had to drink the water with the dust of it and all that kind of stuff. But, but Aaron's saying, worship these calves. Worship, these are thy gods. And, and when, when Moses confronts Aaron about it and he says, Aaron, why did you do this? Aaron does the typical Adam and Eve thing, of, you know, pointing to somebody else. He said, I didn't do it. I collected the gold and I put it in this furnace. And I love these words. And there came out this calf. Seriously? I mean, doesn't that sound like something your four or five year old would tell you about something they did that's obvious that they did and they're, they're trying to cover up? I mean, who's going to... I put in this gold and it came out this perfectly formed, ideal calf. Now, I, I got news for you. You throw a bunch of that gold in there and bring it back out, it's going to be a glob of nothing. In fact, the Bible tells us in Exodus 32, 4... And verse 35, the end of that chapter, that, that, that Aaron fashioned it with a graving tool. But you know what he tried to claim? 
I didn't know anything about it. Man's innate nature to try to make God in some kind of image that he can have the power over. Look at, at, at uh, Isaiah 44. Isaiah 44. I said at the beginning of the message, there's lots of verses, so we're still doing lots of verses, so you know we're still at the beginning of the message. Isaiah 44. I like this story here, verse number 9. Isaiah 44 and verse 9. The end of verse 6, God says, Beside me there is no God. The end of verse 8. Is there a God beside me? Yea, there is no God, I know not any. God is upset with the nation of Israel in this chapter because they're not acknowledging, not acknowledging him as God. And so this story begins in verse 9. They that make a graven image are all of them vanity. So God just writes, everybody that does this, Psalm 115, Psalm 135, those making those things and bowing down, God just writes one word over the whole thing, vanity, you're vain. You think more highly of yourself than you ought to think. You think you're God and I'm not. Beside me, there is no God. He said, all their, uh, their delectable things shall not profit, and they are their own witnesses. They see not, nor know that they may be ashamed. Who hath formed a God? Or molten a graven image that is profitable for nothing. Behold, all his fellows should be ashamed, and the workmen, they are of men. Let them all be gathered together, let them stand up, yea, let, and they, yet, huh, yet shall they, they shall fear, and shall be ashamed together. The smiths with the tongs, both worketh in the coals, and fashion it with the hammers, and worketh it with the strength of his arms. Yea, he is hungry, and his strength faileth, and drinketh no water, and is faint. The carpenter, Stretcheth out his rule and marketh it out with a, with, a, with a line. He fitteth it with planes, and he marketh it out with a compass, and maketh it after the figure of a man. You see how much effort goes into this? Cutting down the trees, the groves, planing the wood, measuring it out, all of this in an attempt to make God. And God says, there's none beside me. Verse number, uh, verse, finishing verse number 13, According to the beauty of a man, that it may remain in the house, he heweth him down cedars, he taketh cypress and the oak, which he strengtheneth for himself among the trees of the forest, he planteth an ash, and the rain doth nourish it. Then shall it be for a man to burn, for he will take thereof and warm himself. Yea, he kindleth it and baketh bread. Yea, he maketh a god and worshipeth it. He maketh it a graven image and falleth down thereto. He burneth part thereof in the fire, and with part thereof he eateth flesh, and roasteth roast. That sounds good to me, roasteth roast. And is satisfied. Yea, he warmeth himself and saith, Aha, I am warm, I have seen the fire. And the residue thereof, <laughs> the residue, the leftovers, after he's cut down the tree, made his fire, cooked his food, whatever's left over, with the residue thereof, he maketh a god even his graven image, and he falleth down to it, and worshipeth it, and prayeth unto it, and saith, Deliver me, for thou art my God. How shameful! How atrocious! How sinful! That somebody would try to make God in their own image. Now you know the epitome of this, and we'll turn over to the book of Romans chapter 1. You know the epitome of this is being fulfilled in our last days. We're seeing the fruit of what happened long ago. And again, with you intellectual folks of this 21st century, we would not make these things, we would not bow down to them, we would see that useless and silly and vain, but we're still following in the footsteps of our ancestors trying to create God in our own image. We'll see that. Look at Romans chapter 1, verse number 23. <coughs> Romans 1, 23. It says about these folks that they when they knew God, verse 21, they knew God, they glorified Him not as God, neither were thankful, verse 23. They changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man. Eyes have they, ears have they, 
Noses have they, feet have they, hands have they. Remember, they were making images of man. But now they've digressed, and to birds, and to four-footed beasts, and to creeping things. Could you believe that man would stoop so low, not just to worship something that they've made in the image of what was made in the image of God, but now they're worshiping animals, worshiping creatures, which were made to be enjoyed by mankind, not to be worshipped by them. Now, I won't go through that door any farther this morning unless I alienate everybody in one message. But simply this, they made images like the birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things, verse 25, who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshipped and served the creature more than the creator. Hogwash. Nonsense. Idolatry is foolish. It's dumb. We don't buy into it. That's long time ago. Nobody does that anymore. None of us have idols in our home. Not those kind, anyways. None of us are worshiping or bowing down to those things. Now, some folks still are, but we're, we're, we're confining this to our conversation here. So how later did man work from that? Well, what happened is man today became too smart to believe in a God made of wood or stone. Because obviously, that just isn't going to fly. Here's my God. See this little statue? It looks like Buddha, I know. But see my, see my little statue here with a big belly on it? I pray to that. I bow down to that. Most folks are too intelligent these days to believe that that is what, what they claim it is. Now, a lot of folks aren't. I, I understand that. But most folks would say, we don't believe that stuff anymore. So we're not guilty of making God in our own image. But can I say this? We've, in, we've replaced idolatry with intelligence. And now if it isn't reasonable, if it doesn't make sense, if it's not common sense, then we simply don't have to buy it. Now this is not new as in, fact, as, as in uh, the 19th century or 20th century. This actually goes back three or four hundred years with what they called modern enlightenment. You have maybe read about that in your history books. The enlightenment period. This was the time where man's intelligence just exceeded uh, their education and, and man just became aware of all things and, and a belief in God started to dwindle back during that time. And we began to make God in our own image. Oh, not carving out of wood or stone, but carving with intelligence. The God that we believed God is. And man continues to make God in his own image. Let, let God be God, but we'll shape him. Let God be God, but we'll determine who he is and what he is and what he does and what he likes. We'll be the boss. You say, how in the world did that play out? Well, that's exactly what happened over the last hundred years, and, and it's out there now, but it's below the surface. Just like the idolatry is kind of under the surface, this intelligence thing is under the surface, but it did its damage. It did its damage with most of the, uh, of the philosophies of the world and many of the seminaries of all places. Uh, we call them cemeteries. Many of the seminaries of the major denominations anymore have followed not the idolatry of their forefathers, but the intelligence in questioning God in everything. That story we just read in Genesis chapter 1, in the beginning God created... Uh, God made man in his own image. In the image of God made he them. You know, it became a reasonable thing to begin to say, well, that really couldn't have happened the way the Bible says it happened. There's got to be a better way to do that. Maybe that's just an allegory. That's just an example or a parable or a, of a, or a story, but not a literal and actual truth. Now, that's the main thought of the major denominations in religion today. That the Bible is subject to what we can understand and what we can believe. You thought that only the cults did that. You thought that was something the Jehovah Witness and Mormons did. They only believe what they can understand. But in this period of enlightenment or intelligence, Christianity, the seminaries and many of those leading proponents of it, all did the same thing. The creation story was adapted to accommodate 
evolution. The inspiration of scriptures. Well, no, not all, not all those stories are true. You, you have one, one, one preacher, my, my late uncle, was a deacon in a Methodist church, and this is going back 50, 60 years, something like that. And he walked in, and they just got rid of the other pastor and put a new guy right out of seminary, put him in the pastorate. And he got up there and he said, now not all the stories in the Bible are true. He said, if you, need, if you want to know which ones are true and which ones are false, I just graduated from seminary. And so you can come and ask me and I can tell you. Now, granted, he had a little bit of useful stupidity going with him. And I, an older fellow would have worded it different, but he was just blunt and plain. And he said, I am smart enough to tell you what is Bible and what is not Bible. You know, if that were true, you might as well pitch the whole thing. If you're going to sit down with that Bible in your lap and say, I don't know if that story is true. I don't know if that word's right. Why are you wasting your time? Go out, go out and do something better. man. As a preacher, if I didn't believe that every word in my Bible was exactly like God wanted me to have it, I'd go, sorry Kevin, I'd go sell cars. <laughs> Kevin, give me a job. I know he would. I'd twist his arm, all right? I'd make you. But if I didn't believe that everything was the Word of God, I would go find a, an honest occupation. See, I, I just gave you credit there. A car salesman is an honest occupation, all right? All right? That's how they, but they began doubting. They said, it's not all the Word of God. They got to those miracles like turning the water into wine. Well, you know, scientifically, that's impossible. Because of the chemical makeup of the water, to change it to wine, it couldn't really have been done. It's just this happened or that happened. He, he put them in some kind of hypnotic trance where they actually thought, and you'll hear all kinds of wild stories to excuse away the miracles of the Bible. You know why? Because man doesn't want to accept God for who he is and what he is. He wants to bring him down to man's level so we can rule over him. And we can decide what God, what God is and what God is not and what God likes and what God doesn't like. And so we take the stories of the Bible. Oh, the virgin birth? <laughs> if you believe in that, you're really old-fashioned. You're really out of touch with modern society. I mean, don't you know? It should be <laughs> medically and scientifically impossible. It should be. These days, there's no telling what they're going to come up with. I think I mentioned this Wednesday night in our, in the, in our study. I, I was watching this. Uh, Brother, Brother Kinsey gave me this little YouTube clip. And it was a female pro uh, professor from uh, Berkeley University. And a senator from Iowa, I believe it was, or some state, was questioning her. And I don't, know what, I don't know what started this whole thing or why they were even having this discussion. It was a waste of time and taxpayers' money, too. But he asked her, he said, can a man have a baby? And that sounds like a pretty easy question. Again, ten years ago, maybe even five years ago, that would have been pretty easy for the youngest among us. Can a man have a baby? You know what her answer was? Absolutely. If a woman identifies as a man, she is a man. But she's still capable of having a baby. And so a man can have a baby. That's called circular reasoning. And it's what the cults are really good at doing. And it's what the college professors are really good at doing. And she was so arrogant. She, she basically told him, you know, you need to come and sit in my class. You could learn some things. And his answer simply was, huh, I'm sure I could. Not what he wants to, but I'm sure I could. Trying to make God in our image. Questioning anything. Questioning the virgin birth. Questioning the miracles. Qu questioning the necessity of the blood atonement. And this is poured down into the mainline denominations where today you don't need the shed blood of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins. It's not the power of the blood. It's your own goodness. It's your social awareness. It's your helping one another. The, brotherhood, the fatherhood of God. The brotherhood of man. All these things have come out of man thinking he was too smart to believe the God of the Bible. And so we're going to replace him with human intelligence. You know that three-pound brain I mentioned earlier? You know what that is in the eyes of God? It's nothing. You take the highest IQ that's ever been around, and you know the higher IQ, the dumber the person. That's usually the way it works out, or less common sense anyways. Now, for those of you with high IQs, I apologize right up front. But you know what that is to God? My thoughts are not th your thoughts. 
My ways are not your ways. As my thoughts are higher than your thoughts, so are my ways higher than yours. You know what we need to do? We need to submit ourselves to who we know is God. When we don't think it, or we don't understand it, or we don't comprehend it, or it doesn't make sense, you know what you simply do? You believe God anyways, because he's God, we're not. He is the potter, we are the clay, not the other way around. So the idolaters, we know they're wrong. The intelligentsia, if we're going to call it that, we know they're wrong. What's that got to do with us? We're not them. We would not, believe, we would not begin to carve an idol. We would not believe, begin to question the stories or the miracles of the Bible. What does this have to do with us? Well, I, I'm sad to say, we sometimes are as guilty as the heathen, as guilty as the highly educated, even as Bible-believing Christians. I've got one last verse. Now you know we're at the end, all right? First Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 3. And let's bring this down to our doorstep. We enjoy talking about the evolutionist and the gender identity and, the, and, and all, all the foolish people on that side. We, en, we enjoy talking about that because it's, it's funny to us. Though really it's sad. It really is sad. We enjoy talking about the idolaters and those that do those different things because that's not us. But let me ask you this. When is the last time when you were reading your Bible you said, God, you're God. And everything you say is right. And I want you to teach me. I want you, God, to instruct me. I want you to, I want you to move my heart and my soul. I want you to draw me closer to you. So that you can be glorified. And you can be edified. And I'm not. Can I tell you, folks, with all honesty, me included, we are no different than the idolaters. We are no different than the Enlightenment folks. We just find a different way to word it because we're more spiritual. We're closer to God. Notice, let me give you the verse and we'll go on from there. Uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3. You know in verse 1 he says, This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. So no, no doubt where he's talking about. He's talking about us right now. They began... A long time ago, but they're even more that way now. But look, just down, jump down to verse 5. Having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof from such turn away. Having the power of godliness, or the form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. You know what the problem with folks in the last day is? They worship a god but he's a powerless God. They've questioned his abilities. They've questioned his being. They've questioned his essence. They've questioned his glory, trying to change the glory of an uncor uncorruptible God to that uh, to, as corruptible. They've done it. We've done, as mankind, we've done everything we can to, to take away the power of God to the point that we get in our day that we try to decide who God is. And what God is like. When you and I sit down with our Bible in our lap, we need to sit down saying, God, you're the potter and I'm the clay. As I read, will you mold me? Will you make me? Will you design me? Will you teach me about you? Because just like the idolaters had a human aspect to them that wanted to make God like them. And the Enlightenment folks had a human aspect to them that wanted to bring God down to their level. You and I are not super saints. We're not at a different level. And in many ways we want to do the same thing. And God many times has to speak louder and louder to get through to us because we're tuning him out. We're approaching the Bible maybe with a lackadaisical uh, attitude. Maybe we're not approaching the Bible as we should. And therein lies the problem. We decide what God is like. Well, I don't think God expects fill in the blank. I don't think God wants fill in the blank. Can I tell you, in 
42 years of ministry. 42 years of dealing with Christian people. I can't tell you the number of times that good, I'm talking about good, saved, baptized, church members, good folks in church, I'll have a conversation with them and they'll say, well, I don't really think God expects me to this or expects me to that. And I'm letting you fill in the blank so that you can fill in whatever it is that you put in that blank. I don't think God expects me to do this. And my response is that, where did you read that in the Word? Where did you find that in the Bible? And ten times out of ten, it's not there. We're trying to make God in our own image. Well, surely God doesn't expect me to sacrifice whatever it might be. God doesn't require me to do this for someone else. God would never ask me to do this. You know what we're saying? We're saying, here's what I think God would ask me to do and should ask me to do or shouldn't ask me to do. And I'm fashioning a God with my own hands and with my own mind, just like the heathen, just like the intelligent folks. We're making God the way we want him to be. And God says, that's not the kind of God I am. I'm the potter. You're the clay. Do we approach our God that way? Do we say, do we say Lord, here I am. Examine me. Search me. Cleanse me. The Bible says that we are predestinated, not for salvation, but predestinated to be to become in the image of Jesus Christ. And God is trying to do that in and through our life right now. But to do it, he's got to be God. We can't tell him, Lord, I'll, I'll give you this, this, and this. But when you ask for that or the other thing, I can't give you that. We're making a God with our own hands. And you and I need to not be like those others. Not be like the folks that, that outwardly and clearly tried to replace God with their own thoughts and ideas. We need to submit ourselves to God to let Him get the glory, to let Him get the praise, to him, let Him get the worship, and not we ourselves. So God made man in His own image. You and I tonight are the image of God. He is the potter, we are the clay. When we try to reverse that process, we mar the clay. When we try to become the potter, we make a wreck out of everything. You know what we need to do? Let God be God. Submit to Him. Acknowledge Him. Be obedient to Him. Ask Him, Lord, what would Thou have me to do? Let's stand together tonight with our heads bowed and our eyes closed. Father, we have taken some time tonight, and I appreciate the, the patience of your folks. But Lord, it's never wasted time when we thumb through our Bibles and read verses. God, if we did nothing but that, it would have been profitable time tonight. But Lord, now we need something in addition to that, not more, but in addition. We need your Spirit to work in our hearts. We need you, God, to challenge us and help us to examine ourselves. Where it is that we are holding back on you, where it is we're telling you what we think or how we feel about certain things instead of submitting ourselves to you. And God, only you know our hearts tonight. And Lord, we're all guilty in one, one part or another of, of, of this category. So Lord, help us tonight to recognize when we try to make you in our own image the way we think you should be and not the way you declare yourself to be. Lord, your likes and your dislikes Father, your favor and disfavor need to be our goal and our pleasure. Speak to hearts tonight as only you can. Motivate us and move us, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Take your songbook, if you would, tonight and turn to page 324. Page number 324. We're going to sing a couple of verses of invitation. If, God, if God's spoken to your heart, 
If God pinpointed something while I was preaching, don't worry about anybody else. They don't know what it is God spoke to you about. But deal with God, either here at the altar or where you're at. But talk to Him. Let Him know that you want Him to be God and you want to be submissive to Him. 324, and has already gotten us there. Let me find the page here in my book. Page 324. Let's sing in the first verse. I am thine, O Lord, I have heard thy voice, and it told thy love to me. But I long to rise in the arms of faith, and be closer drawn to right there this evening Wednesday night we'll be back for Bible study and prayer meeting young people have their thing downstairs don't forget there is a VBS meeting immediately following church here right now so those involved please stick around for that looking forward to our vacation Bible school this year alright let's be dismissed in prayer brother Chuck Blake if you would sir close us in prayer please